going live. Apparently they've added a new button that I have to click as well as everything else. Oh, uh, that's better. Right. That button works. So hopefully everyone can hear me now and everyone can hear Rich now and it's no longer as bad as it was. There we go. Nope, yes, nope, no stream as yet. Nope. There we go. Okay, cool. Thanks for bearing with us there, folks. A bit rusty. It's been a long time. YouTube have changed stuff. Everyone's changed stuff. Windows has updated last night, and all the stuff I tested has turned around and broke. So, no more updates for the next six or seven weeks. How's everyone doing this evening? Has everyone got the beer? I hope so, because we're going to crack straight into it and then start talking about it. Yeah, yeah, we did all the complicated topics last time around, so now we can just drink the beer. Yeah. Hi to Rick, Brew a bit Rick Shaw, uh, Brian T, Dan Walters. Glad you can join us, Dan. If you want to Zoom in, I can send you a Zoom invite, Dan, and you're welcome to join us to talk about Saison. James is not bad, he's in need of a pint, which sounds like a very good idea. I've got you a 3.30. Or if you're like me, you've got two 3.30s. <laughs> and you got one to drink before the stream to get an idea ready. And then you ended up um, fixing tech issues. So let's crack it open. Get pouring and let's talk beer. So, obviously being... Saison de Porto, one of the classic examples, we're going to be talking about this in terms of uh, 25B Saison style. If everyone has a set of BJCP guidelines, that would be a good start. If they don't, on the screen at the moment is 25B. Whilst I just send a link to um, Dan in case he wants to join us. If I can find where the window with the key's gone. Well, Sarah's fighting the technology. I'll read the overall impression and, and to start get us going. So, a family of refreshing, kindly tea with hoppy and fairly bitter Belgian ales with a very dry finish and high carbonation, characterised by a fruity, spicy, sometimes phenolic fermentation profile and the use of cereal grains and sometimes spices for complexity. Several variations in strength and colour exist. Um, Having looked at this, this is a pale standard strength, I think. He says looking for the alcohol 6.5, I think. So for, for yeah, Saison, if you're interested in competition, you have to specify uh, the various, whether it's a pale Saison or a dark one, uh, whether it's standard gra table gravity, standard gravity or super. So table is 3.5 to 5 ABV. Uh, standard is 5 to 7, and so this at 6.5 fits in there quite nicely, and super is 7 to 9.5. And, um, and pale is 5 to 14 SRM, and dark is 40 to 22. So 22 is not very dark, so even the darkest ones are only sort of brown, dark brown maybe. But yeah, I think technically 22 is dark brown. So let's get on to the fun bit. Right. Oh, yeah, this is great. This is, I've not had one of these in a long time, but it's certainly one of those beers that I really enjoy every time I do have it. Oh, do you want to start, start, start at the beginning of your aroma? Uh, yeah, let's uh, super sauce on. Right, so let's talk about the aroma then, shall we? So, if you want to get their, 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 their noses into it, uh, I'll keep going with reading through. So a uh, pleasantly aromatic mix of fruity, spicy yeast uh, and hops. The fruity esters are moderate to high and often have a citrus fruit, palm fruit or stone fruit character. Low to moderately high spicy notes are often present, present like black pepper, not usually clove. Hops are low to moderate and have a continental character, spicy, floral, earthy or fruity. Uh, the malt is often overshadowed, but the text is slightly grainy. Spices and herbs optional, but must not dominate. Sound is optional. I think we should read the comments around that one in a second. Um, strong versions have more aromatic intensity and can add a light alcohol and moderate malt character. 
Table versions have less intensity and do not have alcohol character. Darker versions add more character associated with darker grains. Hang on, I've, I've been showing the 20... For some reason, when I searched the 2021 style guide, the 2015 one showed up. Typical there's, for... I don't think there's, a, there's a good web version of 2021 yet. This is the PDF I'm reading off. Right, the one I've got is there. That's the 2021 one. So does that match the PDF version? Family refreshing, highly attenuated, hoppy and fairly bitter Belgian ales, very dry finish and high carbonation. Yeah, that's it. So very dry and high carbonation, characterized by fruity, sweet, spicy, yeah. Cool. Yeah, right. So at least we've got the new version up now. Unfortunately, yeah. the web search still seems quite balked in that case. So I'm taking these from the, the 2021 version of the guidelines. Did, did, it was 2021 last time, was it 2015? It was 2015 last time because the 2021s yeah. weren't released until like end of December, which to me would say they should have just called them 2022 because that was when people were going to start using them. But such is life. Um, so, what have we got so far? Um, yeah, James's one has a lovely big head when pouring, not massively tight bubbles, but I throw about the word pillowy. I like it. Pillowy is a good word. Uh, lovely golden colour and brilliant clarity. Yeah, we'll. And Dan's got some peppery notes, which is good. Yeah. Uh, peppery notes. Oh dear, Brian. I hope I hope COVID hasn't wiped out your taste buds and senses too badly. Yeah, I mean, I've certainly had that issue for months. I could hardly taste or smell anything that was there, and I kept smelling things that weren't. So. Dan's also you mentioned orange, which yeah, I definitely agree with orange. Um, and yeah, some peppery notes as well. Okay, Brian T, firm yard and spice, coriander and herbs on slightly dulled nostrils. Uh, I'm certainly getting a bit of spice. Um, not sure about firm yard. Uh, how about you, Rich, on that one? I'll go particularly to, towards farm yard yet. Um, <laughs> there, there are saisons that go that way, but they're usually ones that are... Uh, what they tend to be called, they're on wild or um, mm. something like that. Yeah. Yeah, they <laughs> keep changing the names of them, don't they? The which flavour of one is strawberry. <laughs> There's a lot of variety that could be. Okay, so I think, like Dan said, yes, this is pretty complex. There's a lot going on in there. I'm certainly getting peppery spiciness it's um it's certainly a little bit phenolic uh that's to be expected with the yeast types that are used in saisons normally used in saisons i should say it's not always guaranteed orange is another one that's already been called out that's definitely there one of the comments further down in the description is that yeah Brett is not typical for this style. Saisons with Brett should be entered in 28A Brett beer style. Um, and the good news is if you're uh, intending on sitting the exam, 28 won't be in there. Uh, yeah. Normally they only test up to 27. Yeah, so the sours can be in there, but only the classic sours. I know when I read the exam... Last I had to debate with some of the, the, the proctors and I had to show them the piece of paper saying, yeah, I'm allowed to put these in. <laughs> <laughs> what else are people getting? Anything interesting? Too much info from Dan there. <laughs> so you have the honey sweetness. Yeah, I could definitely go with some honey notes in that. Um, some sort of, sort of a bit of a sort of more floral end of, of honey. So, I'll remove uh, that message for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was too much detail, perhaps. Um, oh dear! One thing I'm getting is in the description is the the, the palm fruit. So palm fruits are sort of apples, and pears, and things. Um, so I think I'll be getting a little bit of 
maybe pear-y and sort of red apple. Nothing like you get in something like the Duval we did last time around, where there's loads and loads of pom fruit in that. Um, yeah. But there's a little touch there. And it's certainly not the um, green apple. No. Which is something different. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it certainly did, Dan. It certainly did. But I'm glad to see I'm not the only one having tech issues tonight. <laughs> okay, so back to the uh, phrase I talked about last time quite a bit. When you're trying to describe any of the sections on the judging sheet, things to remember, you need to be talking about what it is how much of it there is, and what type of it is. So that was a good example from Rich there that um, he was getting pom fruit, it was red apples, and it wasn't overpowering, it was moderate or light. Or... So these are the things you need to be sort of thinking of. And whilst we're talking about aroma, the things you need to cover are malts, hops, esters, and other aromatics. So is anyone getting anything malt-wise so far on this beer? The, the one description that the cook we've had so far that can be tied usually to the malt, though sometimes it's easy, is the honey one. Yep. Um, so okay. going through what We've had so far while people bed us some more. Most of these have been fermentation related, uh, with yeah. a little bit of hop in there, I suspect, and some some other. Yeah, Brian's just coming with a touch of bread malt. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, a white bread crust maybe somewhere around there. I mean, these are one of the ones where you can you start with that broad definition of bread and then tunnel in a bit more specific as you go. Um, yeah, an uncooked sourdough, yeah, that, that's quite a good one. Yep. People, that matches up with the style quite nicely. I, I like that a lot, actually, the uncooked sourdough. That kind of gives it a little bit of expectation of a yeastiness as well. Nothing yeah. from James, nothing specifically malty. Honey could be, but that's definitely coming for interactions with yeast and floral hops. It's not straight up crystal malt. I'll, yeah. I'll definitely agree with you there. It's not crystal malt. Yeah, that would be a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, normally we're talking some sort of pale base malt, cereal grains, such as wheat, oats, spelt or rye are the characteristic ingredients. Uh, you may get sugary adjuncts as well. Uh, that's certainly not uncommon in this beer style. I've yeah. not actually seen a recipe for uh, Saison Dupont to tell you exactly what it is. But, uh, yeah, I'd certainly go that there's pale base malt there. Yeah, I mean, the characteristic ingredients are, yeah, pale base malt, cereal grains such as wheat, oats, spelter, or rye, maybe a bit of yeah, Maybe oats. a bit of wheat in there. Uh, yeah, maybe a bit of Saison yeast, spices and herbs are uncommon, but allowable if they don't dominate. So, yeah, it's another way you could put in coriander or something like that at a low level. Oh. Yeah, I mean, nice. saisons are very popular at competition to the point where I think they're more popular at competition than they are for people drinking them, As, especially if you tasted some of the saisons at competition. Um, it's important to remember with saison, it's not just absolutely any beer at all fermented with the saison yeast. Pick two random ingredients from the store or spice cupboard and then enter it as a saison. Uh, yeah, there can be quite a good base style for doing other things on because there's just enough character there to be recognisable uh, without being something like a, mass a massively overpowering beer. Um, well, if I I've done the red currant saison before that worked really well. That was many years ago. Did you enter that one into competition? Because I'm sure I've tried one, but I can't imagine that many people would have done that. Yeah, I think I've done the, um, that was in um, Death Straight Paws International one. That was the one I won with. Okay. Um, that came around to some of the competitions as well. Um, and um, one of our local brewers um, 
I'll uh, uh, brew the red throat says and immediately after I chatted to him about it, which was really quite funny. <laughs> um, I told you about that beer. He, he was he was nice about it. I don't really mind, but um, yeah, um, I've got to brew some more of them. It's, I think I've only brewed one before. It's one of those styles that goes down so well. All right, um, Dan's just said he's just had his first sip, so we what, keep going. Should what I will it? say is. It's also good when you're doing the aroma to take a sip, breathe in through your mouth, breathe out through your nose, retronasal. Uh, what you'll find is that sometimes the aromas can be a lot more pronounced or different elements of it come to the fore when you're breathing out than when you're breathing in through your nose. So um, moving on, what's we thinking of the appearance? Should so, we just give some scores for aroma yeah. first? I'll give you those scores. That's a good idea. So, out of 12 points, what do you think for the aroma? As appropriate to style, so as compared to the style guide out of 12, how many do you think this beer gets? Aroma 10 from Brian T. Almost got a little bit of grape then on that one. I just don't give you this as being higher in fruit esters than I remember it being, but that's yeah. not a bad thing. No, no, it's very pleasant. So I'll just go through the aroma notes again. Pleasantly aromatic mix of fruity, spicy, yeast and hops, fruity esters moderate to high, often citrus, palm fruit or stone fruit. Low to moderately high spicy notes, often like back black pepper, not clove. Hops low to moderate. I didn't hear anyone call out hops. Uh, I'd say they are low. Uh, malt is often overshadowed, lightly grainy. Spices and herbs optional. So, my thinking compared to that, am I getting a pleasantly aromatic mix of fruity, spicy yeast and hops? Yes, it certainly ticks that box for me. The fruity esters, moderate to high. Again, yes, certainly ticks that box. Citrus or palm fruit or stone fruit. Whilst this is an often and not a requirement of the style. Yep, I'm certainly getting palm fruit in there. Low to moderately high spicy notes, often like black pepper. Yep, it's got some of that. Hops low to moderate, continental if they're there. Malt is overshadowed, but if detected, is lightly grainy. That's the only one I would say that I wouldn't describe it directly as lightly grainy. I am getting very lightly toasty and a bit bready. Uh, but other than that, yeah, it ticks most of those points for me. How about for you, Rich? Yeah, very similar. I mean, I, I, I think I'm okay with where where we are with the 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 light grainy maltiness. I'm not really getting much there at all. Yeah. Um, maybe well, the, the fruity as well it can be high, but a little bit more dominant than I'd like. That it's a little bit twisted that way, but it's these are very small points. Um. So for scores we've got in so far, we've got eight from John and an eleven from James. Any more? Uh, 10 it? from Brian. I'm not seeing the 11. I must be lagging. Uh, quite a question from Dan about how will you determine if the spiciness is from yeast or hops. It's a tricky one. Usually the more peppery, phenolic -y ones tend to be yeast. Yeah. Um, the more generally... Spicy, it's quite difficult to describe some of these. Generically the spicy, I think. Generic yeah. rather than sp particular spicy, if that makes sense. Tend, tend to be from yeah, your, your classic German hops. I mean, I tend to hop this with something like Sars mm. uh, or something similar. Um, or, or something Czech, I feel this worked quite well as well. Um, Dan was going with 11 as well. Yeah, I mean, I'd say if you're on like... 10, 11, you're doing really well. Um, Just stepping back for a second to the, the spiciness one, you can put down in your answer from 
hot soy yeast yeah that's fine mm. um if you're, you're you're saying you don't have to be entirely clear we we aren't psychic about what the recipe is um <laughs> how the flavors have come from um, as much as we'd like to be um so james has just worked out my secret i think Apparently, the way you tell his practice and you make your excuses when your confident assertion turned out to be incorrect. <laughs> um, but yeah, practice helps. But it's like anything in beer judging. We can only say what we perceive. Uh, we can't say with 100% certainty that that is right. It's just what we get. Yeah. And you will disagree with us when you get the score sheets back. That that's just that's just normal. Um, sometimes sometimes they're, 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 usually you'll get some good advice, and it's useful to hear what someone else's opinion is. Yeah. All right. Moving on to appearance, then three points. So we're not going to dwell on this. Uh, color clarity and head. We're talking about the retention, the color, and the texture. We've already had a lovely description of a white pillowy head. Um, I've just poured a bit more in. It's still obviously not a great big head now, but it was a good sized head before. What are people getting for clarity? So the color range is pale gold to deep amber in color, sometimes pale orange. Long lasting, there's white, rocky, white to ivory head. Lacing, unfiltered, so clarity is variable, maybe hazy, effervescent. Darker versions be copper to brown, which it isn't. Yeah, and also the stronger versions may be a little deeper in colour as well. Okay. So I'm certainly getting a little bit of haze on it. Um, I was thinking it was originally chill haze, but it, it's it stayed. Yeah, same here, a bit of haze. That's okay for the style, unfiltered. So, poor to good is a fairly good range of clarity. <laughs> yeah, I think Nipah's only go as far as poor. Um. Uh, yeah, I mean that would make a lot of the Nipahs I've had out of style then for <laughs> easy enough. <Yeah. laughs> they do feel like um, a race to be the murkiest be as possible sometimes. Okay, so Dan was just thinking from an exam score sheet whether you'd have to say. You don't necessarily have to say the source, especially if you're not in any way confident. It will be compared to what the proctors say. So if the proctors are mentioning um, spicy phenolics, then you'll match either way. Um, if you're fairly confident that it's yeast derived, by all means put it. Uh, yeast swirling in the glass, heads receded. Yeah, heads definitely gone down, but the beer's been open a while now. Um, well, not receded, but there's still a. The, I, I'd describe that as a. a sort of, it was sort of, yeah, something like James's cloudy description earlier on, then recedes to a thin film and a lasting ring of medium sized bubbles, something like that. Yep. And as for the foam texture. What are we talking here? Are we talking great big loose bubbles that are climbing out the glass like um, a Pilsner or are we talking firm foam lace, uh, firm foam bubbles, small sized, said in a Yoda voice. Quite hazy is my one. <laughs> Light haze, definitely effervescent, head lasts ages, yeah. Um, not going to beat about the bush. It's only worth a maximum of three points. Let's quickly get to what people want to give it. Um, if we look at it against the style for colour clarity and head retention appearance, it seems to tick all the boxes for me. It's right at the pale end of the colour range, but yeah, they're still fine. Yep. A two, a three... Yeah, I, th I think if uh, it's a two or a three, you're fine. Uh, personally, it would be a three. In a homebrew context, I'd, I'd, I'd give this a three. Yeah. Uh, especially especially in a competition where it may not have been treated as best as possible for the last 
little bit. It may be a little yeah. warm. Um, they may not be poured very well. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I've got no obvious reason to knock it from a three for anything I see there. And for saying that's only worth three points in the first place, I'm looking for a definitive reason to knock it down so that I can give, yes, you need to improve this type thing. Definitely. Evening at Three Words Brewing. Three Words Brewing. Like, hey, yeah. Welcome, Three Words. Is this Three Words first time joining us? I don't remember that name from last season. I think it's familiar, vaguely familiar. I think they've, they've joined us at least once last time. Okay, Maybe. fair enough. Last time was know. a long time well, ago. Well, yeah. <laughs> a lot of life has happened in the meantime. Yeah, yeah we've been quite busy in between. Yeah. We'll move uh, on to the important fun bit. AKA Craig from WHBC. Hello, Craig. Uh, yes. Right. Uh, John did accidentally kick it over before opening it. So, yeah, that might have had an impact. So, fairly normal homebrew competition standards then. Actually, no, we don't know much better than that now. Well, mo one, most competitions. Most, there was one competition many, many years ago where a table full of beers collapsed. <laughs> um, was that in a. In St. Werberg's community centre, I uh, seem to. That was at Salt Air. Okay, uh, I seem to remember something similar happening at one of the UK nationals. Yeah, probably, probably one of the early ones. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Moving on then. Let's talk flavour. So we've all been getting our gobs into the beer now, which is good because it's a bit dry otherwise. So we need to be talking about malt, hops, fermentation characteristics. Balance, finish and aftertaste, and other flavour characteristics. So there's a lot to unpack in flavour, and it's worth 20 points. So let's get straight in. What are people talking about for flavour? Talk to me about the malt and the hops. Uh, Dan likes to go on to mouthfeel. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly nothing wrong with doing that. Um, when it comes to you judging, you judge the way you like. You do them in the order you like. I normally go through um, more or less in the order on the sheet. I quickly do a sniff just for anything really volatile that goes quickly, then do appearance, then aroma properly then flavour mouthfeel, but that's just my way of doing it. That doesn't mean anyone else's order is wrong. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, my, my order's fairly similar to Sarah's, in that you're, you're getting those quick aromatics to start with, and then looking at the head before it disappears, um, and the and the initial carbonation before that disappears. Mm. Um, and, and you're also sort of taking note of things like, yeah, mouthfeel and carbonation in your head as you go. Yeah, always always look for the most um, volatile things first, the things that are going to change over time. And yes, carbonation can quite often be one of those. So we've got off Brian ready malt again, like uncooked white or sourdough. Yeah, getting a bit of bready, a bit of grainy. Um, yeah. Honey was a good one that was mentioned earlier. I'm getting some honey. Yeah, James come back with yeah, floral honey carries into the flavour. Banana in the background, very yeast forward. The bitterness is pretty simple and doesn't really seem to feed into the other hot characteristics much. Yeah. Brian's getting a touch of funk. Spicy phenolics. Low clove or is it pepper? His taste buds are still slightly off. Personally, I'm not getting any funk. Um, I'm hoping if everyone's got the bottles from Beer Moth this time, we shouldn't have so much bottle variation like we had last time where some were stored well in chilled storage and others have been on a supermarket shelf for six months in the summer. Um, but, uh, yeah, hopefully we should all be tasting more or less the same things. But that doesn't mean that your mental picture of an aroma isn't different to mine and we might not describe them in a different way. And generally I'd say that's the main difference between someone tasting beer and most BJCP judges. 
we're just better at describing or we we describe things in a more structured and similar way to each other than uh people who haven't gone through the bjcp might do um to link words to sensations is quite a difficult thing yeah um, I, I go back to what we've had here. I, I think I'm also getting a little bit of the one that James mentioned a little bit of banana. I think I could agree with that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, low, uh, the, the Brian's low clove, I think I could, I, could, I could also go with a little bit of that. Yeah, I'm um, mainly getting nice. pepper, but there could be some low clove there. Yeah. Once again, it's one of those things with a sort of boundary line. Yeah. I think it, uh, malt, malt presence in your flavour than the aroma. Ready with tasty notes from Craig. Yep, that works for me. Uh, Brian's not getting much, by the way, of hop. A hint of herbal or grassy hop. Um, I'd certainly say that... Let's try it again. Personally, I think there's a low floral there, a little bit of herb and plenty of spice. Um, I can't tell you for sure that that's all hop or some of it's the yeast derived characteristics. I think most of the spice is coming from the yeast or fermentation now. What well, the people who have done, um, Brian mentioned Drance is there, isn't the sweet beer by any shape. What would other people think of the, um, the sort of level of sweetness versus dryness at this point. Uh, and yeah, I just, I just wanted to say I totally agree with James. Um, it's certainly no basic pale with USO4. I also, I also could go with his nutmeg or mace as well. That's quite an interesting spice mention. Yes, it is. Uh, and I like the way Craig described that. The hops are low, possibly floral, but it's hard to tell in the ester phenolic complexity. And that yeah. does tend to be the case. The more complex a beer is, the harder it is to pick out individual characteristics. And especially to say, well, it's like uh, this level of this thing plus this level of this thing, when it's pretty much dominated by something else over here as well. Yeah, I think this uh, fair mention there's a lot going on. We struggle to get to five lines of the score sheet. This is sort of the point where you need to control with, especially with the exam ones, your language. Mm. So when there's a lot going on, you can use much more punchy phrases than when you're trying to fill up a score sheet because you're describing the American light lager that tastes of nothing. Um, <laughs> so here you could probably be going moderate, spicy, peppery phenols for stop rather yeah. than going. A low level of phenols lurk in the background or something um, more floral about it um, yeah totally it, it's one one of those ones where you're not looking for words or phrases to fill up the blank space yeah. uh, so Dan says the pace I'm going through this bottle rich then it does have a dry finish but the sweet uh, malt honey like that folks have mentioned is there in the finish too Yeah, I think I think this is a good balance of dry, but with still a little bit of intrinsic sweetness there. Yeah, that works for me. A little bit. Yeah, I'm getting to the point where I'm going to be cracking the second bottle soon, I think. <laughs> I, I drank the second bottle. I used to do points. I did, they, they, they don't live well in my fridge. I had to um, be very careful not to open any of them too far in advance. Yeah. Right. Any more we've got here on oh, what's a bit of level, level of bitterness, I think, is another area that's interesting to discuss. I think what we've got we have James on, I think that it's I think it's that prominent bitterness of a bit of carbonic bite because of a sense of dryness, it's pretty sweet in the whole. So the description says uh, bitter spicy aftertaste. Very high attenuation, never sweet or heavy in the finish. We've talked that bit through. Yeah, it's bitter and spicy aftertaste. What do people think of the level of bitterness? For these statistics, the bitterness is only up to 35 IBU. Okay. 
feels like it's quite high up that if it's only up to 35 yeah. IBU. I've never been very good at putting a, f a beer in my mouth and going, that is 27.5 IBU by any means. <laughs> that's a hundred well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> that's not. But... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is the dry finish the empty glass? I've uh, just had a very dry finish then, but I've got a wet one now. And yes, it poured a very big head. It was up there. So if we go 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 on to flavour scores, yeah, I think we better had times ticking on and all that. So once again, flavour is out of twenty points. We're talking about malt, hops, fermentation characteristics, balance, finish, aftertaste, and other flavour characteristics, as per the style. So, we are again comparing what we've got in our glass to the style guide and going, does this tick all those boxes? Pardon me. So, fruity spicy yeast, hoppy bitterness, grainy malt, moderate to high bitterness, and a very dry finish. Uh, initially, the Bitterness was dominant, but the more I have drunk, then the sweetness has come through more to counteract. That's a, that's a good point. And I'll tend to agree there. Yeah, it did seem dry at first. The more you drink, the sweeter it seems to be. So Brian's got a 17 in for the score for the flavour. Any advance or any... Retraction on 17. Um, just going through it in my head again. Sixteen from uh mark down for the malt being a little higher in intensity and character. Yeah, potentially. Well, quite an interesting question here. Is anyone getting any? No, actually, whether that more comes into the next section. It's interesting that the description here describes a light alcohol note when normally alcohol turns up in the mouthfeel. True. You could, you could have the, 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 the peppery alcohol flavours you can get in. So it's one of those interesting ones that sort of that almost can cross between the two areas. James with 1617. A few aspects of the flavour don't meld, at least at least that bitter spicy aftertaste. Any more for any more? Sixteen seventeen James, sixteen Craig, seventeen Brian. Let's what see what Dan there? thinks on it. Yeah. Put Dan on the spot, and then um, <laughs> and then I'll put Rich on the spot for this one to go first. I'm going to put you on the spot, but I'm happy to talk about it. <laughs> going to go 16, says Dan, so it's up to you. I'm quite happy to be put on the spot if you prefer it. I think I'm a little higher than most people. I'd probably be 18, but I think um, I, I'm agreeing with, with uh, Dan on that. I think the sweetness is a little high, um, but... It's once again you're 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 looking at very looking at very small problems here, um, and I'm quite happy drinking this all night. So, well, I'll fall over if I drink this all night. Yeah, I think I'll go with um, John and give it about an eighteen. There's nothing significantly wrong with it. The sweetness does seem more apparent the more I drink of it. It certainly didn't immediately hit me in the face as being a sweet finish or anything. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I think, like, knocking two points off, I can quite happily personally justify. Uh, many more than that, though, I think it would be a stretch without saying, uh, this is the problem, thou shalt not do this. You have to adjust such and such and such and such when you brew the beer again. OK, so, shall we move on? Mouthfeel. Five points, talking about body, carbonation, warmth, creaminess, astringency, and other palate sensations. It's sensational. Uh, 
So Dan, you should have done your mouth feel earlier. Well, what did you think? A lot of people doing that. James saying he doesn't mind the sweetness too much. It's the size of the step change between the sweetness and the bitterness for me. Yeah, I think that's sort of a symptom of it being slightly sweeter than I'd expect. Makes um, sense. In the if it was just yeah, the, the fact it goes from sweet to dry is because it's it's, it's sweeter rather than well, sweet to bitter it means it it's sweeter to start with rather than the bitterness is lower is higher than I'd expect. So from Brian, no creaminess, low astringency. Astringency is an interesting one. Anyone else picking up any of that? I'm not really, but I yeah. can see hot bitterness and maybe maybe it's some a little bit of a general dryness. Yeah, you more or less took the words out of my mouth. It's not what I'll call astringent in a normal sense, uh, but that bitterness is quite assertive, and I think that could easily be um, giving you the impression of astringency. I don't know if anyone else feels the same. We've got uh, from James a lovely soft mouthfeel like a medium thick fruit juice. Pretty effervescence that's dropping as you go down the glass. It's also getting a slight astringency at the centre of the tongue. Just an interesting detail. Yeah, it's hops, I think. Yeah, I think he's agreeing. Um, yeah, I think that's a good call on the level of carbonation. It's one of those ones to, to have a look at right at the beginning, as well as now we've been talking about it for, well, we've been talking about it for like 40 minutes, um, which is rather longer than you would do in a, in a competition. Um, though we're no longer trying to get a beer done in 10 minutes, which was awfully hard work. Mm. Uh, it's more like 15 nowadays, but it's still a lot less time and a lot less uh, conversation. Yeah, I mean, 15 minutes is about the normal expectation. Um, depending on the competition, the time pressure will be um, more or less sensitive. Obviously, by the time you get to many best of show and best of show rounds, generally it's expected you'll uh, be able to knock most of the beers out very quickly because you're not doing feedback. And then it's handbags at dawn over the last five normally, where everyone's championing their favourite beer. Best of show is always an experience if you get invited to do it. Yeah, it's, it's fun. Uh, you, you need to make sure you push you push your point of view as well as everybody else's because it, that at that point it does get very subjective. Yeah. Um, so the overall winner is is the, the beers are separated by small differences and they're entirely different beers. Um, yeah. So it's very, it's very difficult. It's quite subjective at that point. Yeah, in the end, it normally comes down to different people's opinion of, is this absolutely excellent Pilsner, a better Pilsner than this absolutely excellent Imperial American Stout. Sour Beer or Imperial Stout is of that style? And it's like, yeah, you, you really do need to champion the beer and put forward your impression. And, I mean, the last best of show I did was... Um, Brewcon last year alongside uh, Omer, who at the time was national, is now, or he might have been master then, he's now grandmaster. And it was a great experience. Everyone was encouraged to put forward their opinions. And we all came to a unified consensus. So, Dan, a medium body, high carbonation, flavour elements of the beer are keeping interest across all taste buds. Just wondering if the body's a little high and leaves a little fullness in the mouth, and leaves the fullness in the mouth. Yeah, I, that, that's exactly where I was going. I, I think the, the, the body is a little higher than I'd expect. Um, I, I, I totally agree with medium. 
um, rather than yeah, light to medium low body, which is the descriptor. Yeah. Maybe a little of that is because we've had the bottle that they poured for a while and the carbonation has dropped off. Uh, because carbonation is one of those ones that impacts the whole thing and body is one which would impact in particular because if, yeah. if it's light and fizzy, um, that does make it feel a much lighter body than if it's nearly flat like mine is at the moment. Well, I've just opened the second bottle and it's still like proper medium rather than medium low. So I, I think it's right that it's called out. It is certainly degrees, uh, but it is at the high end. Uh, very high carbonation. Yeah, I think anyone calling out high carbonation or effervescence is bang on the money here. Light warming alcohol optional. Is anyone getting a warming alcohol sensation? After a bottle and a half, I'm certainly feeling a little bit warmer. I know that, but that isn't necessarily what it means in the mouthfeel section. Yeah, it's interesting this one because we, we're describing quite a wide range of beers here from the table version to the super. Um, and yeah, you, you do get a bit of alcohol at the top of standard strength, um, but it definitely, it's definitely there in the more punchy versions. So, yeah, Brian T is looking forward to getting called for best of show. It's certainly, um, it's certainly an honour to get to try the best of the best beers in any competition. Um, and sometimes you go in and you come out with a beer that you really didn't expect to be winning. Um, where was it? Lab, I think it was, at 4 Pure, perhaps. Uh, did best of show there and I really wasn't going into best of show expecting a pineapple goza to win uh, but it did it was an absolutely stunning amazing beer wouldn't say there's much warm alcohol on this to be honest I mean I'm getting some detectable alcohol I'm not saying it's warming in the mouthfeel now yeah. so should we go on to scores, scores? Okay, I'll pop my feel slide up again then. So it's five points. Comparing body, carbonation, warmth, creaminess, astringency, and other palate sensations to the style guideline, which on this for my feel is very short. Light to medium low body, very high carbonation, effervescent, light warming alcohol, optional. Sourness rare, but optional. Stronger versions can have up to medium body and be somewhat warming. Table versions have no warmth. Richard and myself didn't specify whether this was entered as a table version or a stronger version, which you would normally have on the sheets if you were judging. I think I suggested it's probably a standard at the beginning because it's in the right ABV range. Yeah. Um, so we have three fours so far. Uh, James saying, yeah, I think it's a four. I'll talk about the slightly high body stops me giving it four. Also, it was mean on taste, so it's not going to give it a three. Yeah, that's fair enough. And then, yeah, two more fours. <laughs> that's an interesting point to call out. It is quite common to balance out your scores across sections. Um, if you look at the very bottom, um, where am I? Can I show a media? No, I can't show that slide. But if you look at the um, bottom of the score sheet, there's a final score range that Rich is holding up to nearly the camera. Uh, yeah, if you cut me off, so I can't really see uh, where it is. And let me put you on full if I can work out which screen you're on. There you go. At the bottom there, you have outstanding, excellent, very good, good, fair, and problematic, though we don't usually give problematic. Um, so you can adjust your scores to actually fit where you think the beer feels. And people do that. Um, if you feel you, you, you come up with a final score and go, yeah, that feels about right. Um, usually you don't need to adjust, but sometimes you'll want the little tweak to go, yeah, I think that's just a bit better or just a little lower than where mm. I've ended up. Yeah, I mean, generally for me, it's like I end up, before I put the scores on the paper, I've already bucketed exactly which of those buckets it's going to fit into and then the scores are like 
tweaked one or two in either section to make it hit that bucket, if that makes sense. Because it's like, if you've got a beer that is truly excellent, world class, and there's just a couple of little things in different sections, then you've got to balance where you take the points off. Um, and I still have a box of score sheets on my desk from when we did the, the, the big judge of beer judging at the club a few months back. Um, so I had one lying around. Cool. A fair few people have done that. One of us has done, done that. So loads of people. Anyway, uh, we seem to be coming down to a sort of consensus of four, which I think I'd agree with. Yeah. Uh, probably knocking one off for the mouthfeel. Um, which is, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, works for me. Right, so after mouthfeel, we got overall impression, 10 points. Describe the overall drinking pleasure associated with the entry and give suggestions for improvement. So all the things we've been talking about previously, this is officially where your suggestions for improvement would go. I've got this terrible habit of talking about them necessarily in the section saying this is too high for the style and I end up tending to put suggestions there. But realistically, this should be where your suggestions go. Uh, you don't keep a score sheet on your person at all times, Rich. Emergency <laughs> score sheets. Um. <laughs> yeah, I've normally got one um, pulled up in the browser ready to use on these streams, but ended up losing about three quarters of an hour preparation thanks to software updates happening overnight. Yeah, it's not having run many competitions over the past couple of years means I've still got a box of both exam score sheets and normal the check box that's been in my loft for like three years. <laughs> oh, you're better than me. I tend to, um, when I run a comp, I get them scanned and they go straight in the recycling. I don't hold on to them for long. I think these, are, these are blank ones. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so where were we? Overall impression again. So what do people think could be done to improve it? I think that's always that's always the interesting challenge when filling out score sheets. And I think as we've said in previous ones, you need to express a quite high level of uncertainty um, because you have no idea what the brewer's actually done. Um, so I, I tend to couch this in a lot of perhapses and may and if sort of phraseology. Yeah, um, it's certainly an expectation that we should never make assumptions about the brewing process. or So, I mean, it's like we shouldn't automatically assume it's all grain or extract or just a kit or anything like that. Yeah, or even in more detail that they mashed at a, at a higher temperature, they, they may not have done and something else happens. Mm -hmm. um, or that they use X, Y, or Z hop, which is always the most... You're always wrong when you, when you start guessing which hops they've done, <laughs> except in the most obvious cases. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, generally, if I'm doing something that's got expected hop characteristics, um, yeah. I wouldn't necessarily call out what they've used, but I might well say um, the style calls for very aggressive American hop characteristics. Try something from one of these families. Yeah, I don't know what I think I'd call out specifically, probably Cal Common, which has a single hop in the listing, usually. Um, is it standard? Um, I Quite might possibly. It's been a very long time. I, th I think the only time I've ever judged Cal Common was the very first competition I ever judged at. It's not a required one, but if, if the hops were weird, I, I might call that out. Yeah. As being the standard. So what we've got so far, we've got a seven from James, a very competent, pleasant beer that's very easy drinking, bitterness doesn't quite melt right with the flavour on mouthfeel. Look at hop choice or timings to bring in a little more balance and complexity in that area. And an eight from John. <laughs> I don't knock it over next time. I don't yeah. think that was the brewer fault. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think the taxi used to float around lovely beer, so you look out for it. James, yeah, good example of the style. Yeah. Yeah, it? it's certainly one of those beers that I've always enjoyed. There's not much that I would say you need to change. Maybe... And, I mean, let's be honest, this is effectively the beer that defined the style. Uh, so I'd say 
yeah, perhaps the mouth feels a little too high. We've knocked it down for that. Maybe the um, malt could do a little tweaking. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, so, I mean, I'm... yeah, I'll, I'll be quite high on this, I think. Yeah, interestingly, the, the, the classic examples in the 2021 are two I've never heard of to start with, then then four I'm quite familiar with. So, Elise Eloise says on 2000, I don't know. The Febre says on 1900, I don't know. Then Dupont, uh, Pipe, Voisin, and Tank 7, all of which are fairly familiar. Yeah, I haven't come across the first two anywhere. No, uh, assuming they may be American. Uh, the Wazim. I've heard of the Febre as a brewery, but I don't think I've ever had any of their beer. Same here. Um... The Pepe I've heard of, the Boisin I haven't seen anywhere. And I've heard of the Boulevard Tank 7, but never seen it personally. James should be familiar with the Tank 7. Tank 7 was always available in booths. Okay. Uh, the, um, the, 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 the posh supermarket of the North, the Waitrose of the North. Um, and we both worked next to one for many a long year. I, I think James has hit the nail on the head there. Um the issue with the de facto beer is it's less likely to stand out. And it's true, if you've got something that's brewed perfectly to style alongside another beer that's perfectly to style but pushes one of the boundaries a little, the one that pushes the boundaries is normally likely to come out on top. Yeah, so I think we've mentioned in the previous series, if you, you, brew, you brew to a corner of the style... Mm. Quite often, it is a good way to win in competitions. Just make sure you make a, a a good beer anyway, because you've got to drink all the rest of it. Mm. Well, I mean, depending which competition you enter, you might end up having to put 20 <laughs> bottles in. <I> mean, yeah. <laughs> if it's a bottle swap, you might not have much left to drink yourself. And we've certainly seen that on some of these bottle swaps. Yeah. The, the male around ones that we've got through half a batch at least. Well, I mean, I know I've been on at least two of these bottle swaps where someone's saying, yeah, you're all enjoying the beer. I haven't got any left. Yeah. <laughs> Are you suggesting James has drunk his way through the entire Booth's beer selection? I, I know I did several times. <laughs> <laughs> Would like okay. the recipe, yeah. Unfortunately, no one's ever sent me the recipe as a result of me saying I want the recipe. If I contact them after the competition and say, oh, that beer you did, any chance I can get the recipe? Yeah, they've been quite happy to share it with me, but no one's yeah. ever done it just from the score sheet. They do have your email. They probably, now they're using stickers, they can at least read it. <laughs> mm. Right, so for me, it would have been an 8 or 9 on the overall impression. So that leaves us with final scores. Uh, so out of 50, where would everyone put this beer? Is it an excellent example of the style? Is it problematic? What do you think? Yeah, I agree with your, your 8 on that. Um, I'll be talking about uh, maybe the mash, maybe, probably sugar in a saison. I've probably mentioned that. It is fairly common to use some sugar adjuncts in it. Mm -hmm. My suspicion is they're taking the sugar out because people don't like sugar in beer. <laughs> Possibly. Yeah. Um, where, would, where do people's totals end up approximately? Having said that, sugar is listed as an ingredient. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty common in science. Uh, on this. Between burly malt and hop. Okay. So, I mean, normally on EU... Uh, labels, especially yeah. the ingredients are in the percentage order. Yeah, above weight, which means it's, yeah. uh, so it feels about the right place for it. So yeah, makes sense. James says about forty-four. I think Lucy's here tonight too. Hello, Lucy. Forty-three from Dan. Yeah, and it's. Everyone else is just doing complicated maths in the background. <laughs> yeah, it's got some things in there that associate with the yeah. pale invert. Yeah, this is what we have stewards at the end of the competition for to check we're still able to add. 
Oh. Yeah. Yeah, judges that are up in the morning quite able to add up, but by lunchtime that ability tends to go out the window. The trouble is, quite often I'm encouraging the stewards to drink along with the judges, so they're not in much better condition than the judges are. <laughs> We're a lot better than we used to be now because we tend to be judging two, maybe three flights rather than four or five, um, which were quite heavy days for some of those early nationals. Oh, yeah. Uh, 55 beers over one day and one evening session I did at uh, the one national. Yeah. And by lunchtime on the daytime, it was like my knees were going. I could hardly add up. and. <laughs> Yeah, lunches weren't great at that point either. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. All right. Oh, yeah, it's got some things there. 42 from Craig. So 42, 43, 44. My numbers add up to 44, uh, which is about where I'd expect it to be for from, from, from me, but we're all within a yeah. judging margin of each other. You're much more organised than me. I haven't been writing scores down. Um Second 44 day. sounds about right on this one i'll be honest if you're between 42 and 45 i think you've done well um we're allowed seven variation if i was to proc to this it would be a 44 yeah so if you're plus minus seven from 44 you're getting some mercs on scoring accuracy cool well, this concludes the scoring. Anyone got anything they want to chat about before we end the stream? Has Sarah uh, 55 beers tonight? No, I haven't had 55 beers tonight. I've had, I'm on my second bottle of Saison. Um, i scrolling back through chat to check his scores. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That that works if you've been typing scores in. If you've been saying them out loud and then forgetting them like me, it's like not so not so convenient to add them up. Yeast or no yeast in your pour? Um, I had a little bit of haze. I didn't stir up the yeast. I didn't kick the bottles over. There's yeast sediment left in the bottom of the bottle. Interesting comment there from Brian. Well, excuse me, beer. Not a lot of perhaps change. Perhaps reduce body slightly with a touch higher mash temperature. I'd probably go the other way. I'd usually go down for lower body, but it's mash temperature. It's it's, it's a bit random. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, normally the perceived wisdom is um, a little bit lower will get you um, less body. That said, in yeah. a brewlosophy experiment, they found that mash temperature wasn't quite the um, the pointer to body that we may have thought it was previously. But I'd always put the um, caveat on there that brewlosophy experiments are great in what they do for the particular beer and the particular style they're testing at the time. In a different style or a different recipe, you may have a different result. Yeah, and it also there's a whole lot of things about thermometer calibration, thermometer placement, uh, variant mash temperature variation across the mash. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it makes a bit, it makes a difference. I mean, if you're right at the top of the temperatures, it's very different than right at the bottom. Mm -hmm. but, or there. but yeah, normally it would be um, unless you are mashing very low to begin with, then normally you'll go lower for a more fermentable, less body wort. Or it could be used different ingredients if you've done a load of maltodextrin or something in there. Take some of that out, for instance. There's multiple ways to achieve a change in body, and this is where it comes down to not making assumptions about process. You can give them a little list of options. That's so that's quite a nice way of doing yeah. it. I mean, this you could say change the mash temperature or change the recipe, maybe different sugar ratio or a different base malt or something. Um, and I mean, especially on some beer styles, that the, having that list of options does help fill up the space. Yeah. Which is expected in the exam. It's not necessarily uh, a requirement of competition. And, and I think that's one thing that I probably should call out as both someone who's trained judges, 
done judge training myself and also run competitions the expectation is if you can fill out the score sheet for an exam you can fill it out for a competition but you may not I certainly as a competition organizer wouldn't expect the full level of detail that you'll put into the exam score sheet in a competition result I mean, generally we're a lot more interested in you getting through the beers than doing an entire sensory analysis on a single beer you should put enough down there that the brewer knows you've tasted their beer and there's enough there to give them the feedback at the end of them to understand where that's come from i mean we have seen score sheets in the the, the, the past that have just had things like why written across them in very big letters let's not do that <laughs> yeah uh, or I, I remember there was once a pro brewer who judged at a competition where their overall impression was it's shit um needless to say they didn't get invited back uh, but yeah, I mean, as a competition organiser, if you've got five lines for a section, I'd expect three lines. On the exam, they'll expect at least four. If you if you drop more than two lines over the lot, you start getting penalised penalised in the exam. Uh, right, James, have to say in our group intro to judging, feedback and advice is more common from those with more judging. Yeah. Totally agree. The more experienced you get at judging, the more focused you get on them improving the beer rather than necessarily going into the ultimate depths of, well, it's um, very low this, definitely low that, moderately low this. Because at the end of the day, no one's entered a competition to find out if they've got very low or low hot bitterness. They've entered a competition wanting to A, win, and B, brew better beer. So if you're servicing those requirements of the entrant, you're giving them what they want. I mean, I'm not saying don't describe the beer. You certainly should. But just bear in mind that the description of the beer should not come at the expense of the feedback and improvement guide for the brewer. Okay, any other last comments? What's the beer for next week? Was that the one we were doing with James? Yeah, I think we were going to have James on and maybe Lucy when she gets in and do the coffee stouts. Okay, so the beer for next week then is the coffee stout. So that will be spice herb veg, I think we said. With uh, a base, we will decide on the day. We will yes. tell you what the base beer is like. It's a stout, it's a... Which one of the stouts are we just going to have a look at the ABV on it and pick? And probably try the first of the two bottles. <laughs> exactly, that'd be a good idea. Maybe, maybe we, we'll, we'll decide what the base style is because we'll, like we'll talk about next time. Um, that's how you need to enter them. <laughs> All right, Dan's uh, finished his strip show, so uh, that seems like a good time to end the stream. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, I hope you'll join us next time. Uh, you've been on my channel. If you feel like it, please feel free to give the video a thumbs up because that helps YouTube recommend my stuff to other people. If you haven't visited Rich's channel, it's Tertiary Brewing. Please pay his channel a visit and give him a subscribe. Cool. Thanks, everybody. That's been good fun. Thanks a lot. Next time. Catch you next time. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe. Thanks for watching Daft Cat Brewing.